Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to Sporty's webinar on Garmin Avionics and ADSB solutions. Happy to have you tonight. Obviously, a very hot topic that's going to affect the vast majority of GA pilots, all pilots across the country in the very near future. So thanks for joining us. My name's Eric Radke. I'm serving as your facilitator for this evening. Uh, I'm part of the educational team at Sporty's. Your presenter, the one doing the heavy lift tonight, is going to be Michael Kerrigan. We're going to get to Michael in just one moment from Garmin. Um, a few housekeeping items uh, as we get started this evening. I want to make everyone aware that, uh, number one, we are recording tonight's presentation. So if you do have to step away or if you miss uh, a slide, uh, not to worry. You'll be able to come back um, within the next couple of days, 40s.com slash webinars, into our archive and uh, you'll be able to retrieve the, the full presentation. <laughs> also throughout the evening, we will have the ability for you to submit questions via the GoToWebinar software. Uh, feel free to do that. We do have, we're not necessarily going to be answering real time, but we will set aside um, some time at the very end of the presentation um, and make sure we, um, we get Michael to answer a few of your questions that are submitted. Uh, throughout the evening. So with that, thanks again for being here. And I'm going to introduce and bring on our presenter again for this evening, Michael Kerrigan, uh, sales manager at Garmin Avionics, to tell us everything about what's new at Garmin and um, the full line of ADSB solutions that are available. Michael, welcome. Thanks for being here this evening. Eric, thanks for having me. I understand you're a little bit under the weather this evening, so thanks for kind of, you know, getting through that and um, uh, sharing with us uh, all your insights and everything new at Garmin. So with that, Michael, I'll let you take things away. Good evening, everybody. As Eric said, I'm a little under the weather, but I'm currently surrounded by about six gallons of fluids uh, from water and coffee and uh, several lollipops. So I'll do my best. I'm dreading the idea of listening to this broadcast again after it's recorded. Uh, but hopefully we'll get through this and I'll answer your questions. I'll try to do my best to cover most scenarios as we know when it comes to ADSB. Um, it's a little bit different for everybody. Um, so it depends on where we operate, what altitudes, how we're using our airplane, whether or not we're flying domestically or internationally and what the requirements are for those areas. So. I'll do my best to be broad, but at the same time give some real good ideas as to how it would affect you and your operations, whether you're flying a 172, a Bonanza, a Baron, a King Air, et cetera. We'll go up the ranks through there. So uh, once again, thanks for Eric and the folks at Sporties, who, who I've been dealing with for many years as the Garmin rep, as the aviation sales manager for primarily the East Coast, uh, South Carolina, up through Quebec and out to Ohio, so that big block of area there on the, on the coast. Um, <clears throat> many of you have uh, met me at various events, whether it was uh, Sun and Fun and uh, Sporty's Fly-In or Oshkosh. And hopefully I'll see a few of you this weekend down at the AOPA. Uh, event at the fly-in down at Frederick, Maryland, where I'll be with a few other Garmin folks, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have uh, about your particular aircraft, and we'll take you through one-on-one. -on -one. At the end of the uh, presentation, if you have any additional questions, feel free to drop those notes and those questions to aviation.support at garmin.com, or give our uh, friendly fellows there at 866-739 five six eight seven a call again they're always happy to talk to you and it's just the same as talking to the guys on the phone as if you were approaching the fellows at uh, the Oshkosh tent while we're out there so um, <clears throat> one more so we're going to go through Garmin's ADSB solution our vantage portfolio of ADSB solutions and the nice thing for us is that we cover solutions for helicopters, experimental, Part 23 fixed wing, Part 25 fixed wing. So we've got a broad spectrum that fills just about everybody. So if you're a customer who owns a Bell 206 and a Bonanza and an RV7 and, and a Citation 10 or a Gulfstream 150, we have an effective solution for you for compliance for December 31st, 2019 
to continue to fly through the controlled airspace here in the United States. We will talk just briefly a little bit about some of the requirements outside of the United States as well. But we'll go through that. So tonight's agenda, we'll talk a little bit about Garmin Vantage, ADSB Basics, Garmin's UAT Solutions, which we have been the leader in ADSB UAT Solutions since way back in the capstone days, where many of you had the opportunity to fly GDL90 with MX20 and GMX200 systems. We'll talk a little bit about some of our newer product, the Flightstream 110 and 210, and its connectivity to the various avionics. Garmin Pilot, which is our application for uh, Android and iOS systems to integrate between our certified platforms and the uh, ADSB systems to then display on the Garmin Pilot uh, application. And we'll talk about the conclusion and the Garmin Pilot coupon, which is something that you can take advantage of before going out to your avionics shop, like Cincinnati Avionics, the installing arm of sporties. <clears throat> so we are by no means the new kids on the block. Garmin has been around for 25 years. We've got a lot of product and a lot of different OEM aircraft and we've been going for a long, long time. And by far, we are the leader in general aviation and in other areas of aviation as well. So I know there's a few of you out there that feel like you own all this equipment already, but um, there's a lot more to come as well. So a lot to see here tonight. We'll try to talk about as much as we can. Garmin has multiple aviation divisions across the United States and abroad. The mothership, Garmin Olathe, Kansas, uh, is a large facility where we design, manufacture, and certify aviation products as well as in Garmin AT out in Salem, Oregon. So big facilities, lots of Garmin folks, lots of smart people designing, manufacturing, and certifying products. So every certified, every FAA certified product is manufactured here in the United States. All right. So <clears throat> if we were in a live event, I might ask the crowd if they knew how to spell ADSB. A lot of folks would look at me a little bit funny, but I, my response at that time would be FAA.gov. In other words, ADSB really is part of the FAA's next gen system. And there's a lot of us out there trying to get information out to the aviation community so that everybody knows exactly what they need to do to meet compliance come December 31st, 2019. You can get that information from FAA.gov or from Garmin.com backslash ADSB as part of our ADSB Academy, where we have multiple videos and descriptive web pages to tell you all about the system. And then we have an area with drop-down menus where the customer can go in, put in his aircraft, put in the existing avionics that's in the aircraft, additionally put in where you operate. I operate at or above 18,000 feet domestically or internationally. And from there, based on your input, we will come out with, or the website comes out with, multiple choices of solutions from Garmin. And we, we have the ability to spit out two, three, four different solutions based on what's important to you and what's important <clears throat> for your operations. So a fellow with a bonanza with a GNS 430W and a legacy King transponder may have a different solution posed to him than that same Bonanza with a 430 with a GTX 330 mode S transponder. And so what we're doing there is showing you the most cost effective way to meet compliance and then the most cost effective way to receive that ADSB FISB and traffic information where and how to display it based on the displays that may already be on the aircraft. So with that, the website is a tremendous resource for information to follow along with and learn about the system and also learn about what's important for your aircraft. Eric, do you have any questions at this point? 
and I take that as a no. So, ADSB definitions, the important part, ADSB out, which is the most important part since that's what the FAA compliance is requiring, is a GPS position source sending our aircraft information to ATC. That's the mandate. The ADSB in information receiving that weather and traffic information is not part of the mandate. That is simply the benefit that you may or may not want to take advantage of. 1090 extended squitter frequency is part of a mode S transponder and it's generally thought of for using at or above 18,000 feet but can be used from the ground up through 18,000 feet. So once again resorting back to that bonanza with a 430W and a 3 GTX 330ES transponder he may only fly to 10,000 feet. It's not based on the type certificate of the aircraft. It's based on your operations. He's okay to fly with that all the way through. If, however, he doesn't have that 330 transponder, he may choose, that operator may choose to go with our UAT solutions, which operates on the 978 frequency, and is kicking out the information after it's collected the WASP position source from the GNS 43530 or the newer technology, the G GTNs, garbage touchscreen navigators, the 650s and 750s, and it's putting that information, pulling the information from the transponder, the loss receiver, compiling it in with the UAT, and putting it outbound. But it's also receiving the information not only from the ground, but from the air. So it's a dual band receiver as well. We're receiving that information from those ground stations or air to air. And the ground stations here in the continental, in the U.S., I should say, are replacing those radar systems that we've uh, come to appreciate over the years. All right. <coughs> Who's affected and when? Well, this is a great question and the idea of do you have a transponder on board your aircraft? And if the answer is yes, then it's very easy for me to tell you that at some point in that aircraft's history, either you or a previous owner has decided that a transponder was important to the operations of that airplane. And unless you plan to limit the operations of that airplane come 2019, December 31st, you're going to need to meet compliance. So it's class A, class B, class E, uh, excuse me, C airspace, at or above 10,000 feet, meaning class E airspace, within 30 nautical miles of a busy airport or down the Gulf of Mexico, etc. But really it means that unless you plan to change how you're using your aircraft now, that you will need to meet compliance in the future. Right. The current ADSB coverage is pretty thorough. We've got 600 ground stations that are in place out there. The mandate for the ADSB out, as I've mentioned a couple times now, is December 31st, 2019. So if come January 1st, 2020, you are in a Class D facility under a Bravo, you're going to have trouble getting your airplane out of there. It's going to need to be taken care of before that. Available today with 600 ground stations and that entire ground station infrastructure is now complete. And we understand that was about a year ago that it was completed. So, so why are we transitioning? Because decades-old radar technology can take up to 12 seconds to provide the update to ATC. At the same time, those radar sites are very expensive on a yearly basis, both on maintenance and if you were going to install a new system. Next Gen is going to come in and update that information once per second, both air to ground, air to air, etc. And the result, in theory, is to reduce the separation along Victor Airways or within airspace to put more aircraft on it. I, for one, will be real happy coming south from the Boston area, going down through the New York corridor, getting past the Deer Park VOR, if I, for the first time, don't get ready to copy. Uh, so it'll be nice if, if, if and when all this takes place that we really are uh, reducing, you know, putting more aircraft on there and there's less reroutes. But 
So as I stated a little bit earlier, how it works, we're collecting that high integrity wasp position source from the aircraft. We're communicating that down to the ground station and air to air. And we're taking that information and we're opening up additional lines of communication so that we have better situational awareness so that we're increasing <coughs> our, excuse me, man. one moment. All right, <clears throat> so the data link traffic from aircraft to aircraft as well as from rebroadcasting from the ground station as long as we have line of sight. The ground stations and the ADSB inbound information is based on a line of sight system. So there are situations where you'll be on the ground and you will not have ADSB, FISB weather or traffic coverage until you've launched and might be, oh, in some cases, 800 feet AGL or upwards of 2,000 feet AGL before that information starts rolling in. But think of it as a line of sight um, system. The benefits provided from the government for this, from becoming and be, being compliant, are receiving free weather information through that FISB uplink through the ground stations. And additionally, <clears throat> the traffic information as well relative to 15 nautical miles of your position source as well. So the requirements are different depending on where you operate at or above 18,000 or below 18,000 here in the U.S. I'm talking all about the U.S. here because we're going to get into the UAT that everybody seems to want to talk about and address in GA. But there are situations where the 1090 extended squitter, if you're an operator, say in Vermont, who operates up into Canada, you have to think of the future if Canada implements a mandate for, um, for ADSB that will require the 1090 because my understanding they're not planning to do the ground station um, system. Same as if you're down south or if you transition to the Bahamas, Mexico, etc. It's something for future consideration. The U18978 compliance system is designed for the U.S. So we'll go through it. If we're operating above 18,000 feet, we need a, an approved WASP position source like the GTN 650, 750, 430, or 530W systems. Additionally, paired with those, <coughs> we're going to need the GTX 330 ES mode S transponder. At the same time, if you have a, WA, a non was 430 or 530 system, it's not a problem. The avionics shops can take those out, return it to Garmin. We make modifications to that board, speed up the processor. It's a three to five business day turnaround where then it's returned to the shop. They install a WAS position, excuse me, a WAS antenna put the 430 or 530 back into the aircraft, do the configuration checks, and make some, do some paperwork to return it to service. We still do that on a daily basis, and the turnaround is very, very quick. From there, <coughs> that GTX Mode S transponder, the 330ES, or the remote-mounted 33ES, if you're using a new GTN 650-750, can be used and those two systems, the WASP position source and the MODES transponder, will meet compliance. At that point, they meet compliance, but we're not receiving any information. So quite often, we see in the field that they're adding in that UAT receiver as well to then display that weather and traffic information on a GTN 650, 750, or recently the added G500 and 600 systems. So in that situation, that GTN 750 or 650, along with the 3030ES, is being used for the outbound compliance. The 978 GDL88 is being used for inbound FISB and traffic information displayed on those certified panels. With that, we're not using the outbound configuration for that GDL-88. That's taken care of by the other equipment. 
From there, if we're operating below 18,000 feet, similar, we still need a WASP position source like the Garmin touchscreen navigators that have been out since March of 2011 and there's thousands upon thousands of applying, or probably the most popular and successful avionics product ever, the GNS 430 or 530 WASP units, either one of those can be paired along with that GDL88 to incorporate that legacy transponder. We've got a long list there. You don't necessarily have to upgrade to a digital transponder. Taking that information from the WAS position source and the existing transponder, compile it into this, put in a small blade style antenna, <coughs> like a transponder antenna, and emit that out. Receive that information in and display it on those 430 and 530s as well. All right. <clears throat> we can also pair it with our Mode C digital transponder, the GTX 327 or Remote 32 for the GTN 650s or 750s. So we can leave the legacy unit if it's in good working order, such as a, a 76A, etc. Or we can upgrade to Garmin's Mode C transponders. Either way, whichever is uh, most effective for your aircraft. All right. So the GDL88, which is available now, and it was announced, oh geez, Oshkosh, if I want to say 2013, I believe it was. So these have been out there for a little while now, and you can go on and blog onto the various blogs and see some really nice screenshots of, of uh, customers' aircraft and, and the, the positive responses that they have had. But we're doing, once again, dual band outbound on 978, inbound receiving 978 and 1090. We're doing surface technology and also patent pending target trend, which you'll see in just a minute. And we're compatible with a majority of those legacy mode C transponders that I referenced one of them just a moment ago. Additionally, an optional WASP position source with dual antenna, if you choose, could be added to the GDL-88, making it a GDL-88 WAS. Now, a, a scenario for that might be, I had one not long ago, it was a fellow with a Saratoga with an existing Silver Crown stack who said he was a VFR flyer and he was simply looking to meet compliance and display weather and traffic on his tablet. With that, and he installed the GDL88W, added an antenna for that GDL88 WASH unit, didn't change anything on his panel, and he was now compliant, and he was receiving the information on the 88, which then with our connected flight stream 110 was displaying that weather and traffic information on his iPad using the Garmin Pilot application that we'll talk about in just a minute. Some of the unique features of the GDL-88 include target trend with relative motion technology. Oh, let me go back there. <clears throat> Which uh, projects others' aircraft flight paths as it relates to your own. So what we're looking at here is kind of a traditional view that we're all accustomed to if you've seen the information coming in on, say, a, a a task system, so we have aircraft moving in front of us 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and you know, we have an idea that they're 3,000 feet below us and descending, but with the new technology we have, we have relative motion lines, these green lines that are showing coming towards us, so we know that we're faster than those aircraft, and we're overtaking them. <laughs> We're overtaking those aircraft. We need to be a little more vigilant and take uh, take more a, a, um, um, caution with those. Very, very important um, features when we're in busy airspace. So we may have anywhere from two to ten or fifteen aircraft. The green lines moving away from us don't need our attention. They're moving off. The green lines coming at towards us. Those are the folks that we have to pay more attention to. Really, really an awesome and cool feature uh, once you get to fly it. So, 
This one, uh, this slide seems maybe a little out of sorts as we talk about all this nice um, free traffic coming up through those ground stations. But as I described, those ground stations um, are for a line of sight system. So Garmin makes active traffic systems with ADSB information inbound that we can use to compile. But there will be situations where we've been flying all day and we're headed into a mountainous area drop down to pattern altitude, we no longer have line of sight with a ground station, but an active traffic system would allow us to continue to see anybody whose transponder is on. So we have multiple um, products in the active traffic system line. The, TAP, the GTS 800 has 22 nautical miles of range with 40 watts of power, and it is not TCAS-1 certified. The altitude capabilities of this is 55,000 uh, feet, same as with the GTS 825 and 855 systems. So we can see what we're really talking about here is power and range and also safety features when we're outside of those ADSB coverage areas or in an area that's out of line of sight to ADSB ground stations. So same with operating outside of the country as well come in awful handy too. So <clears throat> that FISB information comes in through the GDL 88 and can be viewed on the GTN either on a dedicated weather page or overlaid on the moving map page. Unfortunately this next slide is a little bit of a um, you get what you paid for. So the resolution within 250 nautical miles of our position source has great resolution, but outside of 250 nautical miles, it gets a little bit blocky. Um, but then again, well, most of us are flying lighter GA that are probably on the call tonight, and with that 250 nautical miles is giving us an awful lot of information to plan to get around weather. We certainly are not saying that this is tactical weather that you can pick and choose your way through, but more to avoid. <clears throat> With that, we have METARs and TAFs available, NOTEMs, AIRMETs, SIGMETs, TFRs, winds and temperatures aloft. NOTEMs is a differentiator on the FISB system in comparison to the XM series system. We'll show you the differences in just a moment, but important information that are coming in. With that, no TIMS, next round, TFRs, METARs, TAFs, winds aloft, air mets, SIG mets, freezing levels, PIREPs, etc. Those are all available on both systems. You will see a couple of asterisks there, but those are the differences on various subscription levels on XM, but they are available. You'll see echo tops, lightning, storm tracks, and surface analysis, uh, analysis maps are available on XM and not on FISB. But at the same time, like I mentioned, no TIM information is available on FISB, but not available on XM. All right. We have multiple versions of the GDL-88. We have the straight GDL-88 UAT box, which is list price $39.95. I strongly suggest when uh, thinking about ADSB solutions to talk to your uh, Garmin dealer have them give you a, a solid quote on what it is you're doing, um, and even ask a couple different dealers to give a quote. These uh, the shops are very competitive these days. There's an awful lot of business going on, both with new installations and upgrades. Um, so it's it's good to get out there and talk to a few of these folks. Um, GDL 88 diversity with top and bottom antenna configuration. So if you're in a maneuvering uh, situation, you don't have any dropout. The GDL 88 with loss at $54.95, which is an option there. And the GDL 88 diversity with loss at list price, uh, $6,000. All right. So we'll go on to the next one. And what I wanted to talk about was the difference between the GTN systems, the new technology since 2011, and the GNS 430s and 530s, which were designed back during 386 processor days in 1980, 1998 and 1999. 
Unfortunately, those legacy boxes don't have the horsepower to show everything that's available from the ADSB system. So all those features that I mentioned on weather and traffic and target trends and surface trend are available on the GTN system, but there is a limitation on the older boxes, the GNS 430 and 530W units. Right. For those CNX80 or GNS 480 customers out there, they'll be happy to hear that Garmin uh, has put out a software release which then allows the box to meet the WAS parameters towards the ADSB compliance. So a CNS, CNX80 or a GNS 480 along with that mode S transponder with extended squitter will meet compliance come 2020. Uh, unfortunately, that box also lacks a little horsepower and it will not display the ADSB weather or traffic information from the GDL 88. However, the GDL 88 later this year will also get a, another software upgrade which will allow that 88 to emulate the GDL 90 original capstone protocol for ADSB. And then that information will be available to display on legacy MX20s or the GMX200 MFDs that are in production now. So that's a nice way. I mean, these 480s have been discontinued, geez, I want to say six or seven or more years. So we just gave that software and gave, you know, breathed some new life into this product as well. So there's a lot of folks out there who love that box. And, they're going to be happy to continue to use it in the future. All right. We announced back in uh, October of 2014 a lower cost ADSB solution, Garmin's UAT GDL84, which is for outbound compliance for, let's say these are, these are really for uh, legacy aircraft who have not upgraded over the last, you know, decade or two to GPS technology, they have original panels, and this is a way of keeping that legacy bird up there. It does have the ability to bring in the weather and traffic information and port that over onto a tablet, like I had described with that Saratoga a few minutes ago. So that Saratoga did that GDL 88 with WAS, oh, I guess that was about two years ago, a year before this product was available. But if he had been doing that now, the GDL 84 really would have been the choice. That 84 comes with a kit with the Flightstream 110 giving the Bluetooth technology, and porting that information over to the tablet for weather and traffic. All right. Which brings us to some of the Connext information. So what are we doing? We're, we're really trying to get the most bang for our buck, getting as much information out of the certified avionics as possible and displaying those on the very popular tablets, whether it's Android or on the iOS iPad systems. So we're wirelessly connecting the Garmin Panamount avionics to mobile device in a user-friendly way to simplify flying, increase the amount of information you're bringing in, increase your situational awareness, reduce your um, workload, while also bringing in new technology and features to older legacy boxes. So we're allowing for flight planning to transfer between the certified avionics in your panel and your tablet or vice versa, we're adding the weather and traffic display onto that additional large iPad display or mini, and we're adding position and velocity and attitude data from either, say, a G500 system AHARS over onto the tablet or from a flight stream 210, which is all, has an AR system in there and points that information over onto that, uh, that tablet as well for uh, additional backup for an attitude indicator. So the flight planning can go from the mobile device to the avionics or the other way. 
The weather and traffic display can go from the avionics to the mobile app. We can also have the GPS and attitude data going from the avionics, such as I mentioned, the G500 or 600 PFD, MFD systems, over to the mobile application using Garmin Pilot. We take that application, receive the GPS and attitude data wirelessly from the panel to give an additional attitude backup. The Flightstream 110 looks similar. They're three ounces, receive four wires for it. It's a fairly quick install. With that, it's a small transceiver with Bluetooth technology. The Garmin equipment is wired directly to that flight stream, including power. And we're enabling bi-directional communication between the tablets and the Garmin avionics. So with that, if we have a 430W, 530W, or a GTN 650 or 750 series, there's no need for a battery because we're taking ship's power over onto that. <coughs> The active flight plan is automatically transferred from our certified panel over to the Garmin Pilot application. Or we can take that information, do our pre-flight in the morning, and we can transfer that information back to the panel. So we do are on our couch, we plan our flight plan the night before, we come out to the airplane, we do our walk around, we get in, we flip our master. We push the Connects button on Garmin Pilot, and it wirelessly sends that information to the 430, 530Ws, or GTNs. And from there, we preview it and accept that flight plan and automatically load it, including Victor Airway information from the Garmin Pilot into the GNS 430 or 530. So we're adding that Victor Airway navigation that so many have wanted into those legacy products. So on the Garmin Pilot, when we flight plan and we say, oh, I don't know, Boston, Victor 1, Craig intersection, and the 50 or so waypoints fill in, when I push the Connects button, it's not telling the GNS 430 or 530 W box, Victor 1, it is giving all of those waypoints and automatically dropping them in, which of course is making reroutes very, very simple in congested airspace. Right. Some of those features that were available as we talked about on the GTNs are also available on the Garmin Pilot application on the iOS or Android showing that same target trend information. And if we touch on any one of those targets, we'll also see the identifier, our closure rate, their altitude, etc. So lots of information and lots of new technology being ported over as well onto that. As I discussed, the AR's information coming from a G500 or the Flightstream 210 comes over as an attitude backup for uh, on your panel page on Garmin Pilot. <clears throat> that same attitude information coming from the Flightstream 210 or G500 enables a very solid synthetic vision on the Garmin Pilot application. So, as I said earlier, some areas to get information specific to your aircraft and your operations, FAA.gov or Garmin.com backslash ADSB. And if you go through that area and you also go through those drop-down menus, at the end of that, you'll have the option to print out a coupon for participating on that website that you can take to your avionics shop and they and if you make the purchase within the two week period of time the shop will then send that coupon in as part of your order and that will, that price will come off so it's just a way of say, us saying thanks for coming on our site thanks for learning a little bit more about the products and letting us help you choose a cost effective solution in order to continue to fly within controlled airspace after December 31st 2019. So we're going to go to questions uh, if Eric can facilitate some of those and I'll try to open up my, my side slide here. Michael thank you uh, appreciate a lot Eric, of the, 
Yeah, can you, Michael. A lot of great information. We appreciate we appreciate that. So I guess first and foremost, so you know, clearly you spend a lot of time out in the field interacting with Garmin authorized avionic shops, installers, resellers. There's been a lot of talk of late about capacity issues um, for shops and whether or not you know there are going to be a lot of aircraft left out in the cold simply because they can't get. Um, service time scheduled. C can you speak to that? Is this is this real? Is this idea with a lack of capacity? Is this a real thing to be concerned with for aircraft owners? It's it's absolutely real. Um, whether it's right there at Cincinnati Avionics or any of the 125 shops that I interact with on a weekly basis, most shops right now for new installs are six to eight weeks out as far as what they're quoting. Uh, because they're fitting in install work along with the service work for other other things that are going on with aircraft. Um, but there's no doubt that there's going to be a log jam of 2018, 2019 that's going to really frustrate some folks. So I think there's a, a misconception that things are coming down the pipe that are going to change this whole scenario. I, I'm pretty, from everything I've heard of the FAA, they're going to hold stern on that date of 2020, or at least that's what they tell us. In the shops, like like you mentioned, they're getting pretty backed up, and uh, the problem they're having is every single one of these shops is looking for more help to keep up with things, and they're they're finding it a little difficult to to find qualified technicians to fill in those roles. Well, thank you for that insight, Michael. I guess let me continue maybe that same point related to uh, many of the shops that you interact with. So I'm not going to ask anyone to identify themselves, but I have to assume that there are probably some people listening right here that maybe haven't been into an avionics shop for quite some time. So what what would are there some pieces of advice you could offer in terms of engaging a, a shop you know where do you find a, a safe trustworthy home for your aircraft you know how do you go about talking to the right people can you shed some light on that yeah I, I think like us and like many many other manufacturers in this industry um, I mean if you go to the Garmin site and you look up you know find a dealer aviation uh, one of the nice things to know is if they're a Garmin dealer, they're also going to be an FAA 145 certified repair station. Uh, it, it's a minimum requirement for us and many other manufacturers. Um, I, I really wouldn't think this, these type of solutions are things that you want to buy over the counter um, and walk them into a, a shop and have them done. One, of course, is the shop's not real happy to see you bring your own, you know, food to dinner, so to speak. Um, the other is if you're taking it to, you know, the local AP, he's going to have trouble doing the configuration settings and testing for those systems because uh, all the other Garmin dealers have been through. Uh, training, annual training to stay up on not only the products but also the technology, whether they're installing our equipment or somebody else's. So I really think that you need to explore the dealers through the, the manufacturer's site to see who is listed there. If you're going to somebody who's not listed on the various manufacturer's site, you, you really should second guess yourself. Thanks for that also, Michael. A few specific questions, I guess, related to some Garmin equipment. Um, the first one being, can you talk a little about the anonymous broadcast mode, that functionality that the GDL88 has? What is that? What do you use it for? You know, to, to be honest, I, I cannot. Uh, unfortunately, my background as a uh, general aviation or commercial instrument rated pilot is uh, pilot slash sales, business development. Uh, that is a feature I've not used, nor do, I'm sure I went through training on it, but I, I'm not up to speed on that. That is one of those questions that I would suggest that if a customer is, is um, interested in that, they really should take advantage of our tech support line. Okay, very good. Um, Related, and I believe you touched on this, or, uh, talking about Garmin Connects, um, that is functional with a WAS upgraded GNS 430 GPS. Is that correct? Absolutely. 
Okay. It's just a huge, huge feature of being bringing uh, the Victor Airway flight planning uh, capabilities into those legacy uh, products. Okay. Related to the GDL-88, could you also clarify or, I guess, reiterate um, what type of broadcast that is? In other words, is that just a below 18,000 feet or is that above an 18,000 feet unit? So the box can be used to broadcast below 18,000 feet. It can be used above 18,000 feet to receive the 1090 extended square, <coughs> meaning air to air, or the 978 from the ground station, but it cannot have that configuration outbound. So, as I said, so, you know, Cheyenne, King Air, Citation, many of those aircraft have the GDL-88 in there as their weather solution or weather traffic solution above 18,000, but they're not using it as part of their outbound compliance. Michael, thank you very much. With that, um, I, I thank you again for powering through. Uh, clearly, you were a little bit under the weather, so we appreciate you staying with us this evening and again powering through. And, and again, just a, a thanks to you and Garmin for being a part of this presentation tonight. Clearly, an industry leader um, when it comes to all aspects of avionics and in particular, uh, of course, as evidenced by everything Michael provided, just being out on the forefront of um, all this this just vast array of ADSB solutions. So again, as Michael has pointed out, there's a lot of great resources you can find on the Garmin website. Um, I'll make one more mention that uh, Michael and the Garmin team will be part of the AOPA fly-in this weekend in Frederick, where you can talk to some Garmin representatives in person. And believe it or not, with it already being June, I guess it's not too early to make mention of EAA AirVenture Oshkosh. Uh, coming up at the end of July, where, um, Michael, I'm assuming I'm correct, as usual, there will be daily seminars going on at the Garmin 10. Is that correct? That's correct. We have uh, multiple tents at, in the Garmin area. Uh, two tents, and I think it's six seminars in each tent daily. Uh, so plenty of staff there for, for you to talk to. Lots of friendly faces. You know, lots of Garmin, uh, Garmin folks who have been there for years and years, happy to see uh, our customers. Very good. So be sure and look Garmin up if you're at AirVenture Oshkosh. I know certainly I will. And, of course, visit the website as well for a lot of great resources. And, of course, go talk to your local uh, authorized Garmin installer if you have any more specific uh, questions. With that, I want to remind everyone um, that this uh, presentation is recorded was recorded and will be available on the Sporties YouTube channel and also at sporties.com slash webinars. We certainly hope to see you back sometime very soon for another free webinar presentation. For Michael Kerrigan, my name is Eric Radke of Sporties and on behalf of the entire team, thank you so much.